Welcome. My name is Jocelyn Wong, and I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Nantucket Historical Association. And I am so pleased to present the talk today, um, which will feature our NHA Chief Curator and Obed Macy Chair, um, Mike Harrison, in conversation with Jack Fritch, uh, the founder of the Antiques Depot. And they'll be talking about the history and widespread appeal of the Nantucket Lightship Basket. So Michael Harrison has held curatorial positions at the National Building Museum, the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and the Glasgow Museum of Transport. He is the author of numerous books and articles, as well as nearly 70 historical reports on maritime, architectural, and engineering topics for the US National Park Service's Heritage Documentation Program. He's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and holds a master's degree in museum studies from the George Washington University. Jack Fritch first came to Nantucket as a research biologist in 1979. His love for history and antiques quickly led him to co-found the Antiques Depot in 1989 with the late Howard Chadwick. Jack is familiar to many as the former manager of the Islands Auction Gallery for 23 years. Jack's experience also includes participating in many antique shows, as well as providing his expertise to several premier New England auction galleries, nationally known museums, and private collections, as well as being a professional personal property appraiser. So without further ado, please welcome our two speakers, and we'll hear from them and take Q&A afterwards. Good morning. I was hoping, but <laughs> so it, it, as a number of you will often hear me say, um, you know, the Nantucket Historical Association, we're you know famous for doing whaling and the whaling museum, but Islands history is a lot more than just whales, uh, and doubly more so recently with um, the affiliation between the Nantucket Lightship Basket Museum and the NHA, um, where the strengths of the two collections are now combined and we're able to talk about the sort of full history of Nantucket baskets uh, from their early 19th century origins up to the basket work that it continues to be done today um, and the sort of levels of creativity that have gone into these baskets sort of all throughout time. And so what we're hoping to do today is to have a conversation about aspects of these baskets and some history with them. Um, we are we're going to be sort of throwing some questions out occasionally or asking you guys um, what you know or things that you might want to know about baskets. Um, and we've brought some examples to talk around or talk with. Um, and I guess we'll get going from there. I, I wanted to start, um, just for anybody in the audience who doesn't know, although I'm going to expect, expect a lot of you probably do know, um, you know, some of the defining characteristics of an Nantucket Lightship basket, uh, which are represented by this new one that's in process uh, right now, um, they're made with a wooden base. They're woven around a mold. Um, generally, the, the weaving material, the weaver, is, is cane, which is um, um, taken from rattan. Uh, and then the staves can either be uh, rattan, um, reed, as we call it, um, or they can be hardwood. Uh, sometimes you'll see examples that use baleen. Uh, sometimes you'll see baleen weaver. Um, you'll see different kinds of wood being used. Um, and then sometimes you'll see ivory accents being added, um, handles, lids. There's lots and lots of variations. Um, but I just brought this small one to just sort of demonstrate sort of what that, what that process looks like. You know, move it upside down wet this, work it around. Uh, this one is in fact ready uh, for, for the um, rim to be put on and perhaps a handle to be added uh, as soon as um, I can successfully get the mold out of the middle of it, which is sometimes a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of where we are definitionally. Um, but there are lots and lots of variations. And maybe we can start with this one. Um, perfect one. Um, I generally use the same definition, though I stress usually made on a mold. They don't have to be made on a mold. Um, in recent times, some people are exploring fr uh, freeform baskets. Jose Reyes, who's you know, very well known, um, was very fond of freeform baskets. He would experiment in, in different, um, different shapes. He came up with very Bombay 
um, baskets, often very pot belly baskets. This is um, an extremely early basket that Michael and I were admiring. Um, it's almost a transitional basket from an earlier form into what became the Nantucket basket. And it's a perfect case of a basket that was not made on a mold. It's a free form woven basket, so it's, it gets lopsided, it warps with age. Um, if you're not weaving with a, a consistent um, tension in your weave, you'll start to warp very quickly over time. Um, it bellies out. Um, they don't have to be made on a mold. It's also very cool in that um, a lot of people s insist that um, it's all rattan. Rattan stays, rattan weaves, and this is splint. Yeah, with but, rattan. Yeah, with, and then we're seeing the, that key feature of Nantucket baskets, cane, coming in, at least in the rim wrap. And this is really neat. I mean, this has a lot of really fun things going for it. Also, the bottom plate, um, the, the standard way to do this today is that you, you, know, you, you turn, the, turn the bottom plate created on a lathe, and it's got a sawn edge into it in which the staves stick in. So the baskets are, as you weave it, it all holds itself together. This one, the wooden plate at the bottom, is two pieces of wood that have been hopped down together. Um, and then the nails are also serving the function of holding the staves in place. And there's one nail uh, they go all the way around, um, which is pretty great. Um, we don't know who made this particular basket, um, but we do know who owned it. And it is deeply carved on the bottom. You may be able to see the lines. But uh, this is Thaddeus de Fries, um, who was in later life um, Justice of uh, Peace. Is it just of Peace? No, I'm sorry. He was Judge of Probate. Judge of Probate. I'm always doing that. Um, but earlier in life had been an Nantucket whaling captain. Uh, and when he died in 1913, he was eulogized as the last surviving Nantucket whaling captain. Uh, so this is a basket that belonged to him and was in his family. And yeah, it's got these really interesting stylistic similarities to this other basket. One of the things I, you know, we, we don't know precisely when Nantucketers start making baskets with these features. Um, you know, as a shorthand, we'll often say that Sort of the second quarter of the 19th century seems to be when they started. Um, baskets like this start appearing at local agricultural fairs in the 1860s, but there are no agricultural fairs before 1856, so that's not super authoritative. Um, but there are other baskets from elsewhere that have similar features that may be antecedents for this. And, and the standard basket of the time would have a woven bottom. You would not see a wooden bottom plate. We see that appearing in the New Hampshire work basket which has the same key features that we've seen now develop into the Nantucket basket with a, a solid wood bottom plate that's been split to receive the staves. This one's conveniently broken, so you can see where how the staves do insert right into that base. Hard, rigid, wooden rim also split to receive the staves. These are the features of the Nantucket basket. But in New Hampshire, exclusively splint. Shaved splints were used for the weave where Nantucket used cane. We believe the cane was introduced here from um, the China trade. We think it was like the, the peanuts and popcorn of its day, packing material around fragile pieces being imported. And on an island where even today we throw nothing out, everything gets recycled, reused somehow. You had a, a treeless island, not much lumber or materials available, and this bulk of excelsior, really, um, appearing. And someone saw that, oh, we can put this to use. This would be perfect for this. Um, so the, the New Hampshire work basket. New Hampshire was very closely re linked to Nantucket in those days, um, in the earliest of days, through the Coffin family. Tristram's son, Peter, owned the New Hampshire seacoast. Um, dense forest, 200 miles inland, um, was Coffin land. And they had a monopoly here where you could not, on this island where there were no trees, re relatively speaking, you couldn't import wood and lumber unless you bought it from them because they had their, their forest. So schoon is coming back and forth to New Hampshire constantly. So we were probably quite awash with these in those earliest days. And apparently, it, we think it, it's led to, led to our unique form of basket. Yeah. I think it's the direct antecedent, yeah, the direct ancestor of the Nantucket basket. It has those same features. And you don't see wooden plates elsewhere. Um, it's all the same features we see in the contemporary basket even, except for the switch to cane. Yeah, and the material is actually a really interesting thing. I mean, as you just indicated, um, many, many regional basket traditions exist, and most of them are based on materials that you can harvest like this. So if you think of seagrass baskets in the Carolinas, there is seagrass to go out and get. Um, 
and then various kinds of, of woods that lend themselves to be made into splints or the harvesting birch bark, birch bark. pine needles were used, yep. and willow, um, you know, those kinds of materials. Nantucket doesn't really have an abundance of those kinds of basket making materials, um, or those plants don't grow well here, or because of the, the sheep grazing and that, there were just there weren't large stands of this kind of thing. But rattan, so rattan, which grows um, in the Far East, um, was used as dunnage on, on vessels, um, much more often used used less like in a crate to, to, to buffer goods, but to like pad out between the crates in the hole. And scrap wood would be used, rattan would be used, and this would come to, to East Coast ports and be you know, thrown away. So in the 1850s, actually in the 1840s, um, a guy named Wakefield um, starts to realize that you know, wait, I could just reuse this stuff, I could start, um, start making furniture out of it. Um, Okay. Yeah, Wakefield. Yeah, Wakefield. So, so you know, he's the, the, the origin of a very robust Massachusetts-based uh, wicker furniture industry that's based on rattan. And before he starts um, sort of reusing this waste rattan that's coming over upon the ships from the Far East, um, rattan is widely available in the United States. Uh, it's, it's imported into Europe, it's processed in Europe into cane, um, and then that cane is brought into the United States, and there's an extensive use of it um, for chair painting, and chair seats, and all of this, uh, well back into the 17th century. So on Nantucket, um, at any point in the 19th century, that Nantucketers might have wanted a basket material that is robust and easy to use and uniform, um, they can get their hands on cane, whether it's the stuff through Europe or it's the stuff that Wakefield and his associates are starting to process. Um, it, is, it is an available thing. And although it's not a locally grown material, with that like sort of nice hands-on local feel to it, nothing on Nantucket is like that. On Nantucket, you want to build a house, the wood, the bricks, the lime, it, everything you need for it is being shipped from the mainland. Um, all the shingles that we used here in the 19th century either came from Maine or New Hampshire, or they came from the South. Um, and so it's not strange to anybody here, I need a material to do X process. Well, who, where, how do I get it? I can just get it on order from Boston, New York, Providence, Philadelphia, Charleston, sometimes New Orleans. Um, and so rattan fits perfectly into that sort of way of thinking. Um, and it's a beautiful material to use. And the reason I'm saying all this while holding this particular basket is that this basket, except for the wooden, uh, wooden handle and the rims and these beautiful long ears that make it stay, is this entire thing is made of, of, of rattan. Um, all of these staves are, are beautiful pieces of reed, and then um, the weavers are cane, um, which again are just two names for processed pieces of, of rattan. Um, and then it, it ends up with this lovely sort of half round effect. Yeah, the, um, I call it lumpy. It's, yeah. it's such a lovely, lovely look. Where instead of a flat stave, it's giving a contour. Yeah, it's beautiful to do. And I, I've, seen, I've seen makers turn them around and put the lumpiness on the inside yeah. uh, and have the outside be very flat and smooth. Um, and then the bottom here, um, very often, this one doesn't have it quite so much, but often you'll see incised lines um, decoratively on the, on the bottom wooden plates. This one doesn't have it, but there's this beautiful bevel on the inside. Uh, and then they haven't cared quite so much about the outside, but there are three of the thinnest possible lines going around the outside here. It's a very nice, nice thing. Um, this, was, this was purchased by an island summer family in the 1930s. Uh, from a maker here on island, um, or unfortunately they didn't write down who the maker was. But, but it gives us a good date. There are plants in North America similar to cane, the sedge and rush families, um, not that long. And if you look at any wild grass along the length of it, you get that, that hard round um, node, they're called. It's a, 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 like a joint in the stem. You can't weave with that joint. You've got to cut off and then start again. So in the North American species, you get if you're lucky, maybe 15 inches, you'd have to start a new strand. The cane used in the Nantucket basket, um, it's actually called Nantucket cane because we were the, we are, we remain their market. Um, it's this wild, like jungle vine that grows 15, 20, and more feet between nodes. It's so it's the perfect material for weaving. You can get you know, many, many rows before you have to start a new piece in on your weave. It was a perfect material. Philippines. Anticipating the arrival of Jose Reyes much later. We have a, a longer 
relationship with the Philippines. Right, exactly. Um, one of the things that I, I think you know, we ought to sort of talk a little bit about is this like, so you know, work baskets versus decorative baskets. Um, you know, this, you know, splint baskets, the idea that you can, you can take wood and you can make it thin and you make these long strips and you can weave the entire thing. This is a widespread basket practice. Um, and split baskets were well known on Nantucket. There's plenty of like evidence in 19th century grocery stores using split baskets for their vegetable displays and housewives having them in kitchens for storage. This is not the only kind of basket that's on Nantucket, but this is unique to Nantucket. It's very important to me. Yeah. And there's this, this generalized thought that these start as practical baskets, work baskets, so to speak, and then become more decorative um, and, and sort of more finely worked. And remember, we don't have cardboard boxes, Tupperware, all those containers so readily available to us to, for uh, grocery shopping, storing nails, whatever you need containers for. Baskets were the workhorse container of their day. And so we see really wide variation um, in the fineness of the, of the creation of the baskets. Um, and so this is a, a, a we actually don't know the precise date of this one, but one of the reasons I picked this is that, and, and I'm not sure if you can see it from where you're sitting, but the staves, the uprights in this, are sort of all wonky. They, they go in different directions, they're, they're sort of widely spaced, um, they do taper in order to, to, to take in and, and make this curve work, but the maker of this wasn't so concerned about it being a perfect and pristine example that you might set on a shelf and, and it brings you inner peace from, from, from its beauty. He's more like, you're going to go out and use this for something, and it only needs a certain level of finish to it. it, it it's someone crafting it saying to himself, it's just a damn basket. Right. Where later on we'll see a, a much, extremely fine attention to detail and technique. Yeah, and but the, the sort of general narrative of, well, they go from work baskets to more artistic baskets is complicated by when you start lining up the 19th century examples that we have, you get a lot of smaller baskets. You get baskets with very fine weaving. You get baskets with extraordinary attention to detail. Um, and then you get ones that are just, just a basket, just a damn basket. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes by the same hand. Um, and so there seems to be this awareness fairly early on that this useful thing can have this other more aesthetic purpose and can win awards at the agricultural fair, and then can attract the eye of the people who are coming here for holiday. And what's a better souvenir from Nantucket than one of these baskets you can't find somewhere else, and perhaps even better. And, and what you're describing is the evolution of a, a workaday object into folk art. Right, precisely. And I'm going to make an extreme jump here. You know, what's better as a souvenir than one you can actually put in your luggage? <laughs> and so this is a so-called one egg basket. Um, and. Um, Pitchy Ray, in particular, um, uh, maker from the early 20th century, uh, was well known for churning these out. Um, and he wasn't the first person to make them. This is not a Pitchy Ray one that we know of, but it's very similar. Um, you know, where there, there is virtually no practical purpose for this. People come into my shop often and ask me, so why did you have a basket to carry eggs? Why did you carry your eggs around in this little basket? It wasn't used for that. It's yeah. just a, a, a whimsical description of its size. Exactly. Um, and so we do see that the, the transition of the island toward a more, a more resort economy um, basis has an influence on, on attention to what the baskets are and, and what sizes to make, how fine to do the weaving. You know, is it, is it, a, is it a basket that you're giving to, to a family member to use in the home, or is it one that's, that's decorative perhaps to be carried away and enjoyed somewhere else? Um, actually, it's a time to change this basket. The size and shape of a basket often gives a hint for what it was intended for. This round, shallow, open ones um, are usually thought of as being for sewing, the little uh, scraps and spools that you have in sewing. Um, larger ones for gathering uh, flowers in the, the kitchen yard, they used to call it, um, or uh, gathering vegetables. My favorite of the old work baskets is a, a very large one that has a lid attached. It was a feather gathering basket, eider down, or quilts, pillows, mattresses, which to me is just fascinating, having a basket specifically for that. This one's by Captain Thomas James. Um, he is in the running to be maybe the first 
person to make them out on the light chips. We're not sure. Um, but most evidence points towards him as being the first on the light chips and one of the, the first people making the Nantucket basket in general. There is someone else, Roland Folger, who um, certainly was doing it at the same time, maybe even earlier, but on land. There's evidence that both of these individuals uh, first wove baskets on land before out on light chips. And as you reminded me, Roland never served on a light ship. He was, after retiring from whaling, he was a farmer. Um, but there is that transition from first on land, then to, then to sea. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. We're a little sandbar, 30 miles offshore, and we're surrounded by hundreds of square miles of shoal water, very, very shallow water. The main shipping lanes from Europe to both New York and Boston harbors go over shoal water. They're, they're crossing over Nantucket Shoals. We can have a lighthouse on land to guard the way. When you're 30, 40 miles out, lighthouses don't work too well on sand. So we had light ships, these um, hulls anchored in place, ablaze with light, usually two masts with fabulously bright beacons, almost like light, traveling lighthouses. Um, and their job was to just sit there moored at the shipping lane, guarding the way. Um, stay close to us, or you're going to run aground. Um, the sailors, I think, served about three weeks on, and then maybe had three, four nights off. So an awful lot of time on board those light ships, not doing much, since they weren't going anywhere. You had to keep the lamp slip and keep the brash polished. Other than that, don't go crazy. Right. Um, and we think that's probably why James started weaving a basket. I think, well, this will pass the time. When they came ashore on leave, they could sell them. And we do see baskets occasionally with pencil prices of like 80 cents, a dollar ten, um, which we believe was from them selling them on shore. It caught on quick, and eventually, um, it seems that like all hands aboard the South Shoals Lightship were weaving baskets. Yeah, and the, the, the South Shoal Station um, is south of Nantucket, sort of southeast. Um, it's the furthest and most remote lightship station. Um, there were other ones in the Sound, um, Cross Rip, and, and a few others. And so this was the most remote one. Uh, you're out in the ocean. This kind of duty is very boring and very uncomfortable. So the ship bobs up and down. Like, if you've ever been on a, on a, a calm, not a calm vessel, but a vessel that's not moving, but it's in swells, how uncomfortable that is, that's their life. And anchored, you're not bobbing freely. You're, yeah. you're, you're, uh, you're, yeah, yeah. yeah, you're fighting against it. And so we know that uh, Thomas James was first mate um, on on the light ship starting sometime in the late 1860s, and in 1871, 72, he becomes uh, captain. And quite quickly, multiple people aboard this light ship are making these baskets. And then as they as they cycle out of service, or they retire, or they go to do other things on land here on Nantucket. They continue making these baskets, and increasingly, these men advertise that they were part of the lightship crew and they make baskets. And by the 1880s, they start to be called lightship baskets and sort of promotional linkage back to these men and this this thing. Um, in the newspapers in the 1870s, you see references to these baskets, and they're called rattan baskets. They're called Nantucket baskets. Um, the the first actual printed newspaper reference to it as a lightship basket is 1881, um, which means that that terms in currency before that, it's the first time period in print. Um, and so they get this link, which continues today, and it is this very, um, in some ways, romantic idea uh, that that's, has its echoes in Scrimshaw and in decorative knotworks and crochet uh, and in sailors' songs that you know, these men posted away from home, you know, pour their, their love and their interest into handcrafts, uh, that you can then have in your home to remind you of the, of the person who's far away or the sacrifice that they've made. Um, and so it is sort of advantageous to regard them as lightship like baskets. Um, and there is that, of course, a direct historical link to, to these ships. And despite their earlier appearance at the end. Yeah, absolutely. They, are, they, are, they were developed on land. The style springs from the island. Um, it's taken there to be worked on and then gets the mantle of the lightship. And as your question points out, the, the title, the name, Lightship Basket, leads to a lot of confusion. People don't understand why they're called that. Uh, oh, no, it's, per, it's perfect. Ha, half the people that come in and ask me, um, ask if I have any of those lighthouse baskets. Um, recently, one of the cutest questions I've heard, um, 
someone was explaining to their friends that those are the light, Nantucket light baskets. They carried their lanterns in them. They, they, they actually had wicks in these. These were light baskets. Um, which is why discussions like this are important to start uh, dispelling some of these, these myths. Exactly. And with this one, too, you know, this basket, beautiful, elegant shape, very well made in the details. And starting to show some nice refinements. That yes. You were admiring the rim earlier. Delicate, delicate, small little rim, tightly wrapped. The carving, there's one notch on the ear on just one side, not the full. Um, it's, it's showing well signs that this isn't just a workaday basket. It's someone taking pride and care and, and making it art, making it folk art. And then selling it. Yeah, and probably. It, it definitely. It, yeah. The remnant of his label. Um, James had a, a longer shaped label than the standard um, jelly jar label that most people used. His was a longer one. Um, and occasionally you see it actually intact with the writing on it. Um, but labeled because they, yeah, they were selling these. They were selling, and we know that they, um, uh, a number of these men had, had standing relationships with um, shop owners in town. So Mrs. Clisby's, you know, you'd, you'd be able to, you know, buy a lightship basket at Mrs. Clisby's shop on Center Street. Um, there's sort of a whole bunch of associations. Um, the Abbasian shop, Mrs. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, um, we have relatively few photographs surviving of 19th century Nantucket store interiors. Um, there are a few. Um, and one of the best is of Jacob Bajian's shop on Center Street um, with his wife and a clerk standing there. And they're selling, they're selling um, rugs from the Middle East and they're selling household wares. And then there's a stack of baskets on the table. So clearly, that's where you, where you can go and get them. Um, if you know these people, these people are making these gifts. Um, and so we have, we, we, we have, we know of various examples from the 19th century of baskets specifically given as gifts by their makers. Um, and I think, and I, I think I want to make another comment just about, I keep referring, we keep referring to these, these makers as men. And in the 19th century, nearly 20th century, the majority of the makers were men. Um, the Coffin School, many of you may have heard of the Coffin School here on Nantucket, which was a, a charitable school um, set up in the 1820s for um, children who were descended from the Coffin family, which was basically everybody. Um, <laughs> And so initially they were a, um, a Lancastrian style school uh, teaching a sort of liberal arts basic education. Um, by the end of the 19th century, they had become somewhat moribund. And um, a Coffin descendant uh, by way of Brooklyn, uh, Elizabeth Rebecca Coffin, came to Ireland. She sort of took them in hand and she repositioned the school as a vocational school. And one of the things that she felt very strongly with uh, is that they should make baskets and that those baskets should be made in a fine way, um, ideal for selling to tourists. And she oriented her curriculum where those baskets were made by girls. Uh, and this is a, a, a distinct change from the way that they had done. 1902, 1905, that they switched over to that from strict uh, academic into craft. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so we start seeing more female um, makers at that time. Um, although the number of makers here on Nantucket, we, we would definitely say, fluctuates up, up and down at different times. Absolutely. Yeah, soon after that, uh, as you're getting into the 20s, 30s, we're getting into a, a very low point. Um, we might have been down to a, a handful, maybe two or three people making baskets um, when Reyes arrived. Luckily, there were still some people left, um, in his case, Michi Ray, um, that taught him. And then you know, that launched the modern era from a, an open work basket to being presented as a woman's purse, even though that form the lid and swing handle did exist prior to Reyes. Um, oh, uh, A.D. Williams made some like that. Yeah, I think Charles Ray, Charles Ray made one like that. Um, Mitchie Ray made those lidded baskets that for all intents and purposes are the modern purse. Reyes didn't invent it, um, but he cleverly presented as a woman's purse. And that just took off. So instead of this dying out and disappearing, as an extinct craft, it, it, it just leapt into a whole new future for itself. What happened to the I was to say it's still there. Not a school, it's a, a, a private institution that hosts various events, but it still stands. Actually, uh, Sir Admiral Sir Isaac Coffin, a British naval commander, was founded the school. He um, was in the unfortunate position of being in charge of the 
uh, North Atlantic Fleet for the Revolutionary War. So as the British Navy, he was in charge of the uh, the, the quarantine of Nantucket Island, um, which is probably why he made up for it afterwards and endowed the school. And his naval career became quite wealthy, and later in life he wanted to sort of be generous with that toward for people descended from the same family he was descended from. Uh, he visited Ireland um, only twice, um, and he got the ear of um, the local newspaper publisher who was like, if you really want to spend your money well, set up a school. And that's in fact what exactly happened. Um, going back to, to Jose Reyes, I think a really important thing there is that you know the, the tradition of doing this on island was beginning to dwindle in the 1930s and 40s. And Reyes, who was from the Philippines, um, but was married uh, to an American woman um, who had family connections to Nantucket, um, and he was a he was a graduate of Harvard, um, he was American educated, he had served in World War II in the Philippines, and he and his wife came to Nantucket after the war, and he was trained as a teacher, and that's, that's what he would have preferred to be doing, but he couldn't get a teaching job, um, frankly, due to discrimination. And he already knew some basket weaving, and he knew techniques from he the He made Philippines. traditional Filipino baskets as a hobby. Yeah. And he met Mitchie Ray and learned the local tradition, and he started making baskets as a way to support himself and his family. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's sort of Philippine-influenced baskets and techniques in his work, and then there's Nantucket techniques that are in his work. And the, the, the basket purse, um, you know, which in some tellings he was criticized, well, that's not a friendship, that's not a lightship basket. And he's like, oh, fine, it's a friendship basket. Um, you know, and the sort of the marketing of that and the partnering with local carvers to put decorative elements on the top um, which has grown over time into this ability to sort of personalize your basket and have a top that reflects something about you, um, you know, and then telegraph to the world that this, this, this basket is yours. It really did revive this on Nantucket, and other makers um, quickly adopted this. And one thing um, that I saw recently, so he's doing this in the late 40s, early 50s. It's really when, when the basket purse sort of takes off. Um, there was a reporter and a photographer from Sports Illustrated who came to Nantucket in 56, 56. And they took all these photographs of like active people enjoying the summer on Nantucket. And uh, a whole slew of their shooting was done at the Nantucket Yacht Club. Um, so some of it is like people with, you know, going out to their boats and stuff, but then it was like social activities at the Yacht Club. And the number of basket purses in these photographs in 1956 is incredible. It has like swept the island, and everybody's got one. Um, and in many of these photographs, you leave the yacht club and you go off somewhere else where the photographer went, and like there, there are basket purses everywhere. Um, and so it really did revitalize interest, um, and and you know also sort of kept interest alive in some of the older ones, um, you know, and and also kept you know still some of the other ones being made definitely, um, but the purse really sort of become the anchor bed of keeping this all going. Um, and I do have one here. I said there are a lot of basket purses in the audience, so yay, ra ra, thank you. Um, but I wanted to show this one. Um, this is by uh, Bill and Judy Sale, um, local makers uh, still active. Um, and this reflects a number of, of developments that have happened um, in terms of both the basket purse and the Nantucket Lightship basket in general, um, one of which is a trend toward ultra refinement. So very small staves, very finely made materials, very small weaver. Um, there definitely are 19th century examples of small and fine, but it has become sort of a byword of the best baskets that they have this just very fine work. And you can't really see it from there, but at the end you can come up and just see how tiny all of this is and how finely worked and closely spaced um, it is. And the staves are bolt upright, just like the best practice. A lot of the modern basket makers refer to it as micro-weaving as opposed to the traditional weaving where the, the stays would be wider, um, a, a broader base basket. Um, getting it as very, very tight, 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 fine. By appearance, you think it would almost hold water. Yeah. They can get so tight. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is the addition of, of the ivory work. Um, so 19th century baskets do not have ivory knobs. They do not have ivory handles. It's that that linkage is not, not here. Um, but the tradition of using whale ivory as a decorative substance uh, descended from the whaling scrimshanders 
um, that has remained on Nantucket, and the marriage of that into the Basque tradition is definitely something that's happened in the last uh, half century, and allows for just a very you know, new level of, of decoration and refinement to this, where on the Reyes purses, you know, we see him partnering with a variety of carvers, you know, an ivory whale, or a wood whale, but then you start seeing ivory top plaques, um, or ivory name plaques on the inside. Uh, this basket has the innovation, um, um, Alan Reed and yeah. Nat, Nat Plank, who innovated being able to bend the ivory to, to you know, align the handle with ivory there. Um, and then instead of just a knob, it's this actual rose, which reflects the rose on the top. Um, and then this is, yeah, that's, that's right. yeah, that really is beautiful. <laughs> this one also has ivory. Very elegant. Wow. Um, and so you get various variations of this, and, and all of these are like hallmarks of a, of a high-end contemporary basket. Those first race ones had just plain tops for several years, and a, a lovely just whittled wooden peg for the closure. Looked almost like the pegs used for um, uh, stopping lobster claws that the bobsmen used before the, the modern ones. And it was after a couple of years that Charlie Sale, the local fisherman and very renowned folk artist that made ship models, half hulls, dioramas, um, they suggested that uh, Jose go talk to him for an idea of what to put on top. And it was a, a sperm whale carved out of ebony that he put on his first basket tops. And for the first few years, it was just that. And Charlie thought if they liked the ebony, they're going to love it carved out of a whale's tooth. And then that kicked it off. And for the, the first years, the, those first few decades, I think, really, um, the sperm whale, gulls in flight, or an outline of the island of Nantucket were on the baskets almost exclusively. And it wasn't until later that um, individual expression came in and you, people got whatever they wanted to put on top. Yeah, and I've even seen where people you know, will commission a top plaque with engraving on it and then commission the basket to go with that. Yeah, to, to incorporate that in. Um, which is quite a beautiful touch. And so there's there's a lot of variation. I mean, those of you who have baskets of your own that you brought probably will all have individual stories about. This is a 1956 Mr. Reyes basket. I thought it was my graduating from high school. Okay. And it had a $25. <laughs> <laughs> and it had a whale on it, but I changed the whale. Do you, oh. do you still have the whale? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. This is my story of how I obtained my Jose Reyes basket uh, pocketbook exactly, precisely to the day today, 45 years ago. So this is my birthday, therefore I know exactly, but it took ages to get it. Is so that a hint, happy birthday. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I, Tough crowd. I, I accept. <laughs> I accept. So um, the story is that um, we heard uh, my husband Ronald and I would come here for a week every summer, and it took us many, many years before we actually bought a house here and brought our children and so on. Uh, and um, I heard about Jose Reyes and um, went to visit him, just knocked on the door. I, I found out his address. And it was a pretty primitive but wonderful workshop. He was a wonderful man and great to talk with. And he did tell us the story of how he came here uh, after World War II from the Philippines. You, you told it beautifully, um, and really wanted to be a teacher. And at the time, I didn't realize it was discrimination. He just said they had enough teachers, and so they couldn't use me. And so I got the, I, I knew something about basket weaving, and I, I thought he said he got the idea of making it into a pocketbook with the lid. It may not have been his idea, but anyway, that's what he told us. And he was just a delightful person. So he asked us for what we wanted. And there were very few choices, as you just mentioned. So I picked the ivory whale for mine. And mine is about double the size of that exquisite little one right there. Uh, and um, so he took out a notebook. And he said, OK, spell your name for me and all that. And at that point, he said um, it was $40.
but he didn't have any that were available and, and not spoken for. He had some that I could look at. So each year, for three years, we went back, uh, and he said, no, nope, come again next year. And then it turned out to be my 40th birthday. And my mother said, just a few days before we came here, um, this is it. This is the year you are going to have a Jose Reyes pocketbook, and I and she would pay for it. So we went into his shop this time armed with the money, and at that point, instead of forty dollars, well, it went up to eighty, and it might have been a hundred and twenty dollars. We we gave him the cash and proudly left with the basket, and also with the incredible memory of meeting this marvelous, warm, and delightful man who had really made, you might say, lemonade from lemons yeah. uh, uh, in terms of, of creating this. Now, the story has a sequel to it, uh, and that is that subsequently, my brother uh, married, this was his first marriage, but not his last, uh, the daughter of a woman who, uh, and then she told us, the, the, his wife told us the story that her mother and father would sail in to the harbor of, of Nantucket in their 60 foot long sailboat, schooner I think, and um, she would get out of the boat and she would head right for Jose Reyes's workshop and she would say to him, I will take every single pocketbook that you have available, and whatever the price, just tell me, and I will pay you. And that is the reason that it took me so many years to get mine. <laughs> so I suddenly discovered that. And I guess the very last thing I wanted to say, it was wonderful when, for me when the Basket Museum started and, and contained his workshop in it. And they had something wonderful, which was a, once a summer, a, an appraisal day where you could bring in your baskets and have them appraised. And I did that, and it was so much money. I put the slip of paper with the price into it. I brought it home. I put it on my sh bookshelf, and I haven't used it since then. Be rugged. Use it. Keep, keep and, using and, it. And I'm just wondering what something like that might be worth today, about double the size of, of that one, with the ivory, and also an ivory uh, that you closed it with, a, a little stick to close yeah, it with. So I'm going to say that the appraisal business is yours. Um, and I'm, in fact, not allowed to make appraisal opinions uh, because of the museum. But um, I'm, I am going to say before I let you know it, that a lot has to do with um, the condition and, and, and so in some senses, the, the, the resaleability of it, um, I, I, I would say. But Size, shape, it's in perfect, color. Color perfect. is very important. Perfect condition and slightly oval like that one, but about double the size. Yeah, the, the standard size is easily double that. We forgot to mention at the time that this is called a cocktail purse ah, uh, in the small size. It's, Reyes did make, make quite a few of them, not nearly as many as his full-sized ones. And today they're, um, they're, they're a prize. People, many people much prefer the cocktail size than the full size because they, they're just so darn cute. Yeah. So, and, so what and, would and it be <coughs> worth, Excuse I wondered? Me. So value, without seeing, it's just a range. Um, Full-size normal Reyes, assuming in good color, good condition, they can vary anywhere from um, uh, four to 6,000, typically for most of them. Uh, at auction, sometimes some will slide less, sometimes much less. But generally, the, at least the high threes to about six or 6,500 would be the range that most Reyes come in. For a standard. Thank you so much. And I think this is the most wonderful talk. I am just mesmerized and appreciative of what you're doing. Thank you very much. I, I want to I want to jump in and, and just um, comment about the, the Reyes's studio and his workshop. Um, the, the folks at the Nantucket Light Shirt Basket Museum had the foresight to work with the family to collect the core of his working shop um, with his molds and a lot of the sort of ivory work, baskets in the midst of being Paired, um, sort of quite the variety of things, as well as a lot of very individual features, um, Philippine uh, rattan hats uh, that he had in his possession, a few clock that he used. I mean, just like you know, all of these elements where you do get this sense of, of, of the person behind the work. 
And I think that is a very important point, is that these are handmade things, that there are real people in the past and continuing today who make these things. Um, and they're not churned out by machine, um, and that handwork element of it is part of what is so prized about it. You know, and if, you, if you commission one that has a cast of purse for the top that is you know, particular to you, there is an artist's hand involved there, um, and I think that's one of the, one of the things that continues their appeal, certainly, is that evidence of, of the maker's hand that is just so evident, as well as the sort of individual quirks and priorities of the people who made them, um, which I think are well on display in the Museum of Pierre. And is this workshop uh, in, in the museum, where we museum oh, now? Yeah, happy to say, um, it is currently in the Hadwin House, so uh, the core, um, core basket history exhibit that the NHA has right now is at Hadwin House on Main Street. Um, there's a smaller basket exhibit uh, in the Decorative Arts Gallery at the Whaling Museum, um, but the core of, of our exhibit with the Reyes workshop is at Hadwin House. Um, by all means, if you have time, um, please go over and see it. Um, we have a really dedicated group of volunteer weavers who are there um, nearly every day uh, demonstrating how this works and showing showing that. Um, and so I highly recommend it. They're really great. Uh, it's a really enjoyable experience. We're going to plug for that. Hi, thank you. In the, I, I don't know what the word is in terms of the anatomy of that basket, but you could, I can see a little ivory... Um, Yes. Oh, yeah, the, the, the sort of and, and the clasp. The clasp. It's the it's the clasp piece. So it's it's attached to the clasp. That's kind of one. Yes. This carving. is this is one carving uh, that's been woven in integral, and then the pin, which is a held in piece with, with this nylon cord, uh, um, and then this is this is woven with this man uh, around the together, and the hinges are constructed the same way in the back. Um, so to keep these nicely oiled, it'll last for a very long time. Um, People worry about the hinges seen breaking. That. If, if, if something is going to go in a basket, it, it's the hinge. And if, a, if it's in heavy use, you're using a basket as your daily purse, um, they were usually considered, expected to last maybe about 10 years, and then you'd have to have the hinge replaced. Uh, and it's not a drawback. It doesn't detract from the basket. It doesn't really affect the value appreciably to have them replaced. It's expected. Oh, no, you totally do it yourself. Um, that is the seed oil. Although I, I, the basket people in the room will correct me if I'm using that one. Uh, uh, Needs need foot oil, yes. Thank you, Kevin. Need for leather. Yeah. Oh, for leather. Yeah, for the leather. That's right. Um, yeah, so I would like to ask if other people have questions or if people have heard funny stories or interesting stories that I'm wondering if that's true or not. Um, one of my favorite stories is with the Reyes purses that have two balls on the top, um, where uh, quite often on a Reyes basket that has ivory knobs, um, when you move the handle, they squeak. And people think that, oh, it's, it, I've, got, I've got the seagull one, and that's the sound of the seagull. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're such a clever <laughs> um, That is, in fact, just a characteristic of the ivory. Um, but I particularly love that idea. That's the seagulls. Hi. I was wondering, I've heard, is it a myth that the nomenclature of the Nantucket basket parts um, stem from the parts of a barrel that were used in the whaling ships? So the nomenclature is borrowed from, from coopering. Um, whether there's a direct um, link between coopers and basket makers is uncertain. Um, there are similarities, and we do know of um, wooden barrels and then also wooden pails made on Nantucket, where some of the handle details and some of the construction details get carried over into basket work. Um, but we don't know specifically that oh, this cooper then is making baskets. Like that, that linkage, we don't know. Um, but it is definitely a Nantucket thing to refer um, to refer to the pieces in a sort of cooper way. Uh, uh, staves, staves, primarily, where yeah. elsewhere it would be more common to say a rib. Um, some even use uh, something we think of more in, in rug weaving, warp and weft. Some people refer to the, the vertical and horizontals. Yeah. But um, generally rib or stave. Here stave because so much of our language on island for centuries has been linked to, linked to the sea and to maritime pastimes, livelihoods. Yeah. And it is one of the things that's, that's nice about it, um, rounding it on Nantucket. 
is that, I mean, you'll, you'll see, you know, you pick up a basket, we read books, and like, now let's make a Tucket Lightship basket. And they'll talk about Warp and West, or they'll talk about you know, the uprights or something, and you're like, okay, well, they've got, food, they've got part of it, but they don't have the whole spirit while you write. Um, is it, I've also heard that the, the, the tops that are called rims, that in other baskets, more traditional mainland baskets, they're called hoops, maybe, or something like that, or? I don't know if that's true, I just heard. I, I hear rims a lot in, around the country, around the world in, oh, okay. in baskets. Um, I'm sure some are called hoops. Yeah, I'm less familiar on that front. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I've, heard, I've seen them once or twice, but I've heard about people embedding pennies in the base of their basket. And how did that come about? One individual whose name I can't remember. No, nope, before him. It was, there was one specific individual that um, started it and uh, um, acknowledged as being the originator. And then lots of people, Bill Severns famously, started putting them in all of his baskets. And at one point, lots of people did. We know that it was one person in, in particular because in the it was probably mid, late 80s, um, there was a bit of ferocious legaling going on. There was lawsuits where someone was trying to get everyone else out of the works and trying to patent. At one point, even the name Nantucket Basket, they were trying to patent. So no one else could make one except for them. Uh, and one thing they seized on was the penny in the bottom. said, so no one else can do it. I do it. And this gentleman appeared in court as a witness and testified that, yeah, I did started doing this in such and such a time. Um, in spite of that, uh, the judge awarded in the, the litigant's favor. And she ended up with a patent on pennies on the bottom, and everyone had to stop doing it. Really? Yeah. Are people still doing that at all today, or no? Has it kind of fallen out of favor? Well, at that time, it's, it fell very much out of favor. Um, I've seen it more recently done. Um, that woman's now long gone. She's no longer in business. I'm not sure if she's with us. Uh, definitely not in business and on island anymore. Um, and I've, I have seen more modern baskets where people started putting pennies in again. It was a very clever way of dating it. The penny always had the date that the year was made. Yeah, and a lot of, like, like the, the James basket we have here, which has the, the adhesive remnants of the label, you know, for, for many of these guys, when they're turning these out, they're selling them like, you know, I'm one of the people who makes this, and you want one of my baskets, and, you know, an adhesive label is perfectly fine. With the hindsight of 150 years, you're like, okay, that's not permanent enough. That's going to fall off. That's going to get worn out on the table. And, you know, marking your basket as your own creation, you know, finding other ways to do that. And so, you know, we get baskets, you're not gonna be able to see this where you're sitting, but, you know, the sales have engraved into the bottom, you know, their own name. That's a very common thing um, that you see other people. Um, uh, uh, well, starting with Reyes, with the, the purse stage, almost all purses are signed. Not all, you'll occasionally see some, but uh, it's, it's more the norm to be signed. Prior to him, the, the 19th century lightship baskets, very, very rarely signed. I think most of the ones for sale had labels. We see so many baskets that have nothing. They probably did once have a paper label um, that just disappeared. Unfortunately, they didn't do a more permanent signing. Yeah. Um, Gardner, Folger, you will see some that you know, proudly, deeply carved with intent right into that bottom. Um, but unfortunately, not enough, not enough of them did that. And early Right, that's the other thing to be, to be cautious with, is that you'll see these early baskets and they'll have a name on it, and it is almost always the name of the owner. And today, um, you know, you get, there are people who will um, commission a brand, and there's a, a hot brand to put their name on it, that starts in the 50s as well, Boyer does that. Yeah. Um, Boyer Gibbs. You know, this particular one, which you're getting on where you're sitting, uh, this has been stamped with um, die numbers and letters, um, again, to sort of make sure that Karen had a uh, on the penny issue, I think that that derived from the fact that it was a superstition still going on to throw a penny as you go around Bram Point as you're leaving for good luck that you would return because that lighthouse was always considered the lucky lighthouse even back to the days of the whalers. And I think the basket maker put the penny in the basket so you'd have it when you were leaving, you throw it overboard and you make sure you come back. That's great. Thank you. So if you start making um, baskets on your own, you can mark them so that your posterity knows that they were yours. Don't, don't rely on adhesive labels. 
That's your take home for today. Are there other questions we have? Michael, would you just talk a little bit about the beautiful uh, symmetry and balance of those older baskets, which they did from their mind, the way they had the shape of the basket, that it always, particularly in the good ones, looked beautiful and classic. And, and the fact that that symmetry was um, something that they just took out of their own genius. I think there's definitely an aspect of that, and some of that will vary depending on the, the talents of the particular makers. Um, but, you know, as in any sort of folk art craft, um, practitioners who do things for a long period of time develop, you know, a rack of eye, they develop the ability to sort of, to sort of see balance um, in their own work. And one of the things with these with these baskets is that, you know, by mostly being um, woven around mold, there's obviously the creation of the mold, whether your eye brings you to a mold that's chunky or a little more refined, but then the basket is assured to have a symmetrical shape if you've made the mold correctly. And if that was a success for you, you can make duplicate baskets based on that. And I think the James example that's here is, is definitely a case in point of, although this basket, yeah, exquisite maker, real eye for, for the sense of, of portion with this, the basket itself um, has has deformed a little bit over time, um, you know, just based on the tensions within it and the types of materials and, and the rim being so fine, it doesn't have a lot of strength to withstand. If you think of a bunch of weight in a, a fragile constructed piece, as that pulls down like that, you're going to naturally pull these sides in yeah. just from the weight from the use, yeah. so you will get that warping. But I think that's one of the appeals of these baskets is the ones that are really finely crafted. Um, where the artist has, has put some of their, their experience into this, um, really sort of helps keep these at the forefront of interest today. It's part of the beauty of all antiques. It's showing very much its age, the, the use and love of 100 years, 200 years that, of that piece being in existence and used by people. Michael, while we all have baskets back here um, ourselves, I would like Bunny to show off basket as one of our modern ones that is just spectacular. Um, this, <clears throat> this purse is design, was designed by Kathleen Myers, uh, and she helped me make it. Um, she, the staves and the trim going around the front and back um, is baleen that I carved and then polished. Uh, the hardest project I've ever done. <laughs> Without know. Kathleen, yeah. I could not have completed it. But um, it's her design. It's a cocktail, a cocktail purse, and um, we worked very hard just to get the baleen, big pieces of baleen, down to popsicle size sticks. And then I spent a whole summer polishing from about 220 grit to. 3,600, something along that, to get the shine and the polish. And, um, and the plates, front and back, are ebony. Uh, you know what? I have my name inside, but I didn't sign. I mean, I have a, a, I have a um, ivory plaque with my name inside. It, it really demonstrates that you know, creativity in this continues. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's come a long way from this. In, in shape, in, no, not as a joke. In shape, it's it's on its side. Tell us about that wonderful bracelet with the hearts on it that you're wearing. Is it ivory? Yes. Um, it's called it's called my grandmother bracelet. Um, I have a heart with Mimi on it, and then the remaining hearts are the nine grandchildren that we have. Leanne Papali did the scrim. So it's lots of fun. And how could I get one for my and having grand, <laughs> eight grandchildren? I think you could go and visit Leanne at her shop. Um, She's the person who helped you. Yes, she um, she had the blank bracelet, which I purchased, and then told her what I would like. So it's still, she should still does hearts. Um, yes, I'm I think. Sure. I think Alan Reed made the bracelet. Did Alan make it okay? Uh, but there are other people who could still do that for you. I just had a heart made um, for something I'm putting on the inside of my purse, but Nap did that. Oh, yes. Nap is doing 
Yeah, Nat Plank is a wonderful carver. He gets a little backed up and slow sometimes, but his, um, his basket minis are spectacular. Yeah, where, where is the shop? Uh, I'm going to jump in because we're going to do the, do the craft exchange after, afterwards. Um, I think we have time for just one more question, and then, then we'll wrap it up here. Do you mind if we go here? Yeah. Hi, uh, probably more a uh, question for Jack. I was just wondering on the Reyes bags in particular, I've seen a variety, some the bottoms are pristine and you can see his signature on the island beautifully. For those who don't know that he puts a uh, outline of the island on it. And then his, others- His wife actually. His oh, wife, his wife did, his wife did I, See, I didn't yeah. know that, okay. And then others, I've been told an expert can tell that they're Reyes baskets by looking at the weave, but you turn them over and someone like me, I, I, I don't necessarily know it's, him because it's really worn off, it's been well loved yep. and well used. Does that affect the value of the bags? It, it shouldn't, but inevitably does. Okay. Uh, people do like a signature. Um, and you're right that generally we can tell a Reyes immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and even when it's worn, look, you tilt, look at the, get the light the right way. And usually it's a pretty rare one that you can't find the, the shadow, the trace of, yeah, I've seen of that like signature. Where you see the shadow, but it's not prominent. Not prominent. Yeah. For that reason, a lot of people put little feet. Right. Um, uh, like mounting pins were used. I actually just did that on one yeah. light. <laughs> um, I haven't seen it so much lately, but I used to see a lot of baskets where um, people cut a baggie apart, and the baggie was fastened onto the bottom of the basket to protect the signatures. Very crude looking, but we used to see that pretty often actually, as people realized, hey, I'm losing his signature. It's like wrapping your furniture in your best room. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for coming today. We really appreciate it. Uh, for the people who come from across the water for this, we really appreciate that too. Um, if you have further questions when we're done, we're happy to answer all of them. Thank you for coming.